Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to come out you know, and speak and have a good time. Lahak is awesome to be back. Um, thank you again for having me. I hope this talk will be useful. You know, definitely, if it's not, ask questions so I can be able to answer as many questions as we have time to do. Um, so just a quick background of, of who am I. You know, I'm, I'm blessed to be a computer science PhD I'm student right now at uh, Purdue University. And before that position, I was a director of cyber operations, in which I was able to establish a formal schoolhouse on how do you train large groups of individuals to do certain types of cyber operation. Before that position, I was an instructor, computer science at the US Air Force Academy. And so I was able to do that, as well as direct research at another university um, in the summertime. Then before that position, I was director of intrusion response and incident handling. So at least I have a good background of incident, ha incident handling, forensics, as well as reverse engineering, in which I have that here, being a SOC manager and then a software developer and then some education um, at the bottom. OK, so here are some things to expect in this presentation. Okay. So hopefully we'll get through most of these. I usually don't. I usually always run out of time. But we'll see how much time that we have for today. Um, but just real quick, a disclaimer. So uh, the views that are presented in this presentation are those of me. So it's me and the research that I'm doing at my university. It does not represent the Department of Defense or the US Air Force. OK, so research motivation. Now, I have this quote here. So any sufficient advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And the thing about using and talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning, it seems that there's a lot of magic that goes on behind the scenes. And so if we want something like something useful, we'll say, oh, well, I'm using the AI, and suddenly good things come out of that. And that's not the case at all. And so I would like to hopefully demystify um, like some of these misconceptions. I want to make this applicable so that we can go off into our domains and then start to analyze or study how like, artificial intelligence or machine learning can be used into various cyber, um, cyber domains or cyber analysis um, for the future. Now, let's talk about the obvious. So let, let's address the elephants in the room. So when we talk about malware classification, there will be many individuals that will say, but you know, malware classification, artificial intelligence, we've been doing this for a while. Organizations may say, OK, well, we have antivirus soft. Sorry, my, my firewall's coming up. Um, so we have like antivirus software. We have endpoint detection. You know, we have various things working on our computer systems right now. So you know, wh why do we need this, this artificial intelligence to come out and help us? Others will say, well, I have the next generation X, or I use software as a service, infrastructure as a service, service as a service. There are many different things that people may use, but it's important to understand that malware continues to increase in sophistication and prevalence. And so we also need to adapt our approach in order to secure our systems for tomorrow. So I like to use this chart as an example. Here, this is showing, like, over time, how the increase in repositories have been, um, or have been enhanced with AI-generated or AI-assisted code. So from many years ago, like, let's say 2016 or so, you see, like, there's a linear climb in the use of artificial intelligence to help us generate code that's being used into repositories. Until a sharp climb here from 2020, this is kind of when, like, our chat GPT your generated um, pre-trained models. Like this kind of came online for people to start to use. And then BARD also comes online, or now it's called Google's Gemini. And so like people are starting to use these. And now you see a sharp climb after this from 2022, kind of when everyone, well, I'm sorry, I can't say everyone, but when a lot of people are using like GPTs to help us generate code. And if I'm honest, I am guilty of this too. Because instead of spending hours on Stack Overflow trying to figure out some simple function, I can now just spend like two seconds with a good prompt, and now good code comes out for me to use. So if we are starting to see a sharp climb in the use of code repositories with AI-generated code, well, what happens in the future when there are these GPTs that are trained exclusively on malware, that are trained exclusively on source code, and exclusively on how to exploit computer systems without guardrails? So what are we going to do then? OK, let's, 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 let's talk a little further. I look at virus total you know, often when I'm doing malware analysis, reverse engineering, et cetera. I kind of want to have an understanding of what malware am I looking at if someone else has uh, adapted this malware before or you know, uploaded the malware to virus total. So hopefully, it can just enhance my analysis. So for the last month, virus total has reported every day 
that they receive over 2 million samples that are uploaded to, the, to VirusTotal in order to determine if these samples are malicious. Of these 2 million daily samples, over one, actually now it's updated, over 1.8 million are distinct samples. That means samples we have not seen before, the samples that are completely new and generated daily. Now, I've been looking at this chart, I've been looking at it for a while. I had stats here from March, and in March, this was only 1 million was distinct. So from March until now, it's climbed to 1.8 million distinct samples that are uploaded to virus total daily to determine if these samples are malicious. Now, a quick question that should come into the mind is, how often is your antivirus updated? I don't know if it's receiving these two plus million samples every single day in order to be able to detect um, new malware. So our, our systems will always be behind unless we adapt a new approach. And ultimately, this is not an industry problem. It's a problem that we all should be focusing and spending time to understand. Okay. So that's why we come to our research motivation in which we're saying that new strategies are required in order to better detect and defeat new malware of the future. And I posit artificial intelligence, machine learning, can be one of those mechanisms to better detect and defeat emerging malware that we've never even seen before. All right, so let's move on to our formal problem definition. There are four. The first one, there lacks a standardized malware language that uniformly describes artifacts that we can extract from malware from static, dynamic, and memory analysis. Number two, there lacks a robust framework that helps us automate this entire process. So to be able to standardize the, the data that we need to immediately pivot and, and put this into our machine learning models, that framework does not easily exist in an open source manner, which is why we're focusing on this as part of my research. Three, there lacks a large database or large updated data sets with the artifacts that we've spoken about before that can help us immediately go into artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning analysis. So if you read the literature, like different literature reviews on people who have done this type of classification in the past and even present, a lot of them will actually update or mention data sets that have been used long time ago. So since 2013, so new research is coming out today that's referencing data that's over 10, 12 years old. You know, how can we continue to stay up to date with new malware? That's because no system like exists freely to the masses in order to help us um, um, do this um, faster. And then lastly, there lacks an ensemble model that's capable of analyzing this large, disparate set of malware and to still be able to detect new malware with high precision and high accuracy. So overall, that's what we're here to hope um, to, to present a way of doing all of these things. Now, I mentioned model, and in this presentation, I'll mention model a lot. So what, what exactly is a model? Okay, well, let's start with a definition of a model whenever we talk about this in artificial intelligence and machine learning. So here we are. A machine learning model learns patterns from the data, and then we want to use the patterns via a mathematical function in order to generate predictions. A supervised learning algorithm is hopefully able to identify specific patterns and parameters for each of the independent variables that come in to help understand or explain your um, predictive or your, your outcome variable at the end. And here we're calling it the response variable. And then in our case, we want to apply parameters, i.e. weights, to each of our independent variables. So I'm going to give you a feature vector of x. We'll just call this x as our large ma matrix of vectors that um, describes each binary sample. And then hopefully we want to learn how important are each features so that in the future, when I give you a feature vector of a binary, I want to be able to determine, well, how, how similar is this sample to something that we've already seen in the past. So again, we can enhance and optimize our reverse engineering and our detection. And then this is a simple linear regression that I'm identifying here at the bottom. And so whenever you, we're using a model to generate a function or to give us a, a prediction, we usually call that like y hat. And so this is just our prediction of the actual function. Okay. So here, I'm kind of skipping forward and going kind of quickly because I, I, I don't have time um, to talk of everything regarding this model. But let's say we have a data set over here. And then the data set has different dots, OK? So I'm just looking at two variables. We can liken this to, um, how about this is a, a, a plot of the number of years that a house um, exists on the market, or number of years a house has existed since it's been developed. And then this is the increase in value over the years. 
So if you're like a venture capitalist or an investor, and now you want to give money to other products to like buy houses or so, and then you, you want to ask yourself, okay, if I give you $2 million today, what's going to be my return on investment tomorrow or next year or the few years after? Okay, we can use a regression to help us predict what that line will be. And so we'll, we'll generate actually multiple lines of these, and then we'll see, okay, how similar is our generation line uh, close to the actual ground truth of what we've seen in the past? So the regression line that is closest to the actual data, when I'll say, okay, this line or this function generalizes well to the data that I see here and the future data that we've not seen yet. So now we actually adopt this model once we find the best fit line. Okay. So there are similar or, or common models to understand when we talk about like malware analysis or linear regression, et cetera. Very common models that I just want to show here. And again, I don't have time to talk about all of them, but I just want to show this so that in the future, when we have time to research on our own, you know, if you don't know which models to, to research, well, let's start with these. Okay, so if we're talking about machine learning models for classification, then we kind of have two main types of machine learning that we're going to talk here, and that's like your supervised learning and your unsupervised learning. So with my supervised learning, it just means each of my features are, are well labeled. So that means for all of the independent variables that are coming in, your different attributes, file size, headers that are inside a binary, um, the size of each header in the binary, like various features inside that binary, okay, I then have like, a label or an explanation for each vector that's coming in. A regression, this is when I have like continuous data that I now want to make a prediction, um, but the, the, like, the output is going to be like a, a numerical format like a number, a real number, I'm not sure. But discrete numbers, okay, like categorical numbers, I'm looking at a classification. If it's a continuous number, we're talking about a regression. And underneath those, I just put a few functions or different models that we can look at to see, okay, how do I accomplish like a classification or a regression, um, different types of analyses. Okay? Now, on this side, we have unsupervised learning. So unsupervised learning, we don't really know what's present, I just have data. And so now we kind of want to understand, OK, what are our associations? What are the unique things that we can see here? What are the similarities between a population? For instance, COVID. So when uh, you know, COVID, COVID is a thing, so you know, some people will get COVID, and they will live just fine. They won't even know they're, they're infected with COVID. Others will get COVID, and within days, they're dead. And so now we want to analyze and see, OK, well, what's the distinction? Like, what's the difference between this population over here, who are just fine, and this population? or some random population over here who die really quickly. Like, what, 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 are the, what are the similarities on why some people will die and others won't? Okay, so that's where we would actually look at, like, some sort of unsupervised learning. And so we'll start to cluster, like, group people, and then we'll start to analyze further, like, what are the similarities? And then hopefully we can come up with better predictions or, you know, abatement mechanisms in the future. Something else we can use unsupervised learning is, like, di uh, dimensionality reduction. So I... I I wish I had time. Uh, so I was talking to Daryl. He's like, you know, when we get up here to talk, we have like weeks worth of material and only like, you know, 20 or 30 minutes to present um, like what we want to talk about. Um, but here, if we, if we have like many features, so each feature, you can also consider that as a dimension. So it's referenced as like the curse of dimensionality, that if we have too many features, then our model might not be able to um, be as precise with its predictions, because there's just too many. We're finding like the decision boundary and the differences between each feature, it's infinite, because I've got so many different um, dimensions that we, we need to work on. So we may try and reduce the dimensionality first, and then move into a different type of um, classification and analysis. OK, so let's get into our workflow. So understanding what models, understanding how we can apply these, let's see, OK, what's the starts to finish way of looking at a problem throwing some machine learning models towards it, and then seeing what the prediction looks in the, on the back end. Okay. So here we are. Just, I, I, I like pictures. I like workflows. So here's one of them. So if we want to start with machine learning models, the first thing that I will start with, uh, and anyone should always start with, is like an understanding. So uh, literature may also reference this as a business understanding. And here, we're, we're just figuring out like what, what data do we have what problems are we trying to find? And then we start to formulate like, some research questions and some hypotheses. I think this, I think that. And then we, you know, we try and just see, like, OK, what do we want to test in our data? We always start with some sort of hypotheses and an understanding of what we have. Then we move into our data collection. So data collection is tough. 
we have here two main types, like your structured um, data and unstructured data. Most of the time, the, the actual data that you're going to bring in and work with is unstructured or semi-structured. So we'll use some sort of code to kind of structure this so then I can move forward into the next phase of our workflow, which is going to be our data wrangling. So data wrangling may also be um, references like data pre-processing or data processing. All of these actually fit under data wrangling. So inside our data wrangling step, we want to look at the data. We may actually start to do some sort of exploration, like some explorative data analysis to figure out what are some similarities to the data that we have. So it kind of helps further guide along additional research questions that we want to analyze in our study. Then we also continue to look at the data. And so we may do some sort of augmentation. We may, we may actually begin to add features to our data that we're already looking at. And then we also want to see, OK, what are our final labels? Like, what, what, what is the classification of what we're looking at? From that step, we may um, move forward or kind of progress into like data cleaning. So when I mentioned, most of the data that you're going to deal with is raw, unstructured. And so this raw, unstructured data may also have missing elements. And so we're going to spend some time trying to clean this data in order to get it into our models. The cleaner the data that we can put into our models, the better outcome or prediction we may hope to get out from our analysis. Okay? Then when we're finally done with these steps, we move into our feature engineering. So our feature engineering is when we have many different attributes on a data set. We now want to specify, well, which ones do we want to model? Which ones do we want to say, OK, let's try and use these to help us towards our prediction. Not all data elements that we receive are going to be useful. Then finally, we move into modeling. Now, in this time frame, whenever we look at this, I want you to see that like, whenever we talk about like, artificial intelligence, machine learning, we kind of, look, think of think of this as like, you know, I think I mentioned at the beginning, it's, it's a really, really sexy thing. However, most of our time is actually spent getting into the modeling. Because once we're here with our data, it's an automated process from there. You look at the models, you wait for the analysis, and then you see, we go into evaluation. How well was it? What do we need to change, et cetera? Then we move into our evaluation. So if with each function that we create, we want to ask ourselves, OK, how well are each model, like how close is it to the ground truth that we spoke about before? The models that are really far off, you actually eliminate those because they're not going to be accurate. And then we see, OK, which models are actually good and accurate and has the smallest loss function um, that I spoke about at the beginning of the presentation. And then we go with this. So that's what moves us into our model selection. So we're selecting the models. Remember, I also had a chart of many different models towards the bottom. So we select the ones that work best to the data that we're given, and then we move forward. Calibration is also important. So calibration states, if we select a model that appears to be good, the model purports to be a successful, a useful model, we may also give it new data that it's still really never seen, even in our testing, to truly calibrate the model to make sure it is as good as it says it is. Sometimes we may have to change a few things at this point. But again, we're trying to enrich our models in order to get to good classification and prediction. Then finally, we move into the deployment. So deployment, once we like our models, once we like the data that we receive, now we start to execute. So any new malware sample from this point that we receive, we actually just throw it into our already trained models to say, OK, what's the new classification or what's the new prediction at this point? Okay. Now let's bring it closer into our malware analysis domain. So in this type of classification or analysis, we're going to talk about multinomial classification. So multinomial classification just means that there's more than one class. So classification, we start with like a binary type of classification. That's like a 0 or a 1. Is this malware or not malware? Goodware, not goodware. You know, will a person live or die? That's like a binary choice. But here, we want to have multiple choices so we can enha enhance our detection of various malware. Okay. So if we look at a portable executable file, a PE file is rich, very rich with attributes and artifacts that we can actually throw into our machine learning model. So here we are. If we start with that executable, we can see that that executable has headers and various sections of where different parts of code and like different imports and data is going to reside within that executable. But if we move forward to the right side, now we can actually see the attributes that we'd want to bring out. So for instance, the signature, this is an attribute, like the MZ. Or the PE, I think, is what, what that one is showing. Or like imports. So where are the imports here? I think it's towards the right. It's kind of blurry um, on this side. But you know, so if we have different imports like create file, open file, open register, we can now extract each of these and, do, and then do prediction on these to see if I see this in the past, 
I can learn which malware families use these types of features and imports at specific sequences. And then in the future, if I see something that has the exact same or similar sequences of what I've done in the past to a percentage, like a confidence interval, then I can say, ah, yes, I do believe this is malware. Not only do I believe it's malware, here's my percent confidence of how malware this malware might be, and then this is the family it could be associated with. So all of this is just to save us time in the future, since malware is going to continue to evolve in prevalence and sophistication. Now, in my experience of doing reverse engineering often and time and time again, I usually find myself in a new binary. These are kind of the six main areas that I care to analyze in each binary that I'm receiving. So it's metadata, you know, like what describes the actual binary, how does it want to execute by the operating system, that's what I list here at the top. The import functions, that's what I list here as the library functions, like, you know, what are the import actions that this, this binary may want to do? What are some of the export actions that this binary, like a DLL, may want to export to other functions, or it may want to inject into another live type of process? Then I could look at the syscalls. So once I go from this library into the kernel or the operating system, like which system calls are going to be invoked by this process? Now, when we're doing like IDA or you're doing your debugging and disassembly, we're actually looking at you know, the functions and the opcode of this specific binary. So we can also load these into our machine learning models to help us figure out like what is new or what, what have we seen before, what do we not know, and help us detect these different types of malware of the future. Strings is important because, for instance, if I'm dealing with a type of ransomware, and you know, at the beginning, uh, like the, the opening of uh, La Hack, you have the video, it's like all your bases are belong to us. Um, but what if we see this type of vernacular in different samples in the future? For instance, you have to go to this website, buy this type of cryptocurrency, like um, paste it here, or call this phone number. What if we see this types of sequences in the future? We may be able to understand, okay, this is very similar to something we've experienced in the past. I think it's malware. I think it's this type of malware, like incident handling or invoke some sort of action, block, you know, alert, et cetera. We can use machine learning to help us learn these different um, similarities. And then finally, your event tracing. So event tracing is when I'm launching this dynamically, or if I'm stepping through this sample, I'm trying to figure out what it does on the system, well, I can actually create a sequence of events that this binary is going to do. I can use these similar sequences in order to help us predict of new malware in the future. And this is if I'm going to use like deep learning to help me understand time sequences from this specific sample. So there are ways that we can extract specific artifacts from a binary to now be able to get into our model. All right. Now let's look at feature acquisition using a well-known tool like VirusTotal. So here, VirusTotal, just a show of hands, are we familiar with VirusTotal a little bit? Yeah, that's, okay. That, that, I expected this. I mean, we're at La Hack, by the way. I mean, Jason, you're right. Everyone, everyone's an elite hacker, so that's, that's really cool. Okay, so here we are. If I have a malicious sample, I'm going to throw this into virus total. Some of the uh, first things that we'll look at is like, how malicious is this sample? And so that's what we're showing here at the top. You know, like, what's its, its malicious number? How many antivirus vendors have detected this sample in the past? Then we look down, we're kind of starting to look at some of the metadata that describes that binary sample. Well, as I mentioned, that's metadata that we, we spoke about on the previous chart. VirusTotal also includes like the library functions that this sample may have. It either is, is coded inside the sample, so I can extract these statically, or we can build this dynamically, depending on how advanced that malware is, but I can bring out the library functions. And then finally, there is some understanding of the opcode analysis and event tracing when we go towards the behavior tags to see, OK, what are some of the, the, like the events that this actual sample may invoke while it's in execution? All right, now let's talk about the problem of using these well-known vendors and, and having like commercial and large data. So in order for these models to be useful and effective, we do need a large amount of data. OK, so we can go to VirusTotal that has lots of data to be able to say, hey, let me, let me download like, quite a bit of your data so I can put it into our models. Well, the problem with this is VirusTotal is very expensive uh, if you want to be able to extract lots of their already analyzed data. I know this firsthand because I try to reach out to VirusTotal at the beginning. It's like, hey, I've got a lot of samples. I've got terabytes of malware. I would like to be able to use you. Right? Since you've already done this analysis, let's go ahead and partner, let's collab, um, so at least I can take a look at your antivirus detection since you've already done it in the past. Like, let me bring that over so I can just save time in our analysis. And they're like, no. Access to our data at the commercial level is hundreds of thousands of dollars. Can you believe that? Like, hundreds of thousands? That means people are paying 
hundreds of thousands of dollars for this large data set? I'm like, I do not have that at this time. And so they, they actually cut communication with me. I, I never heard from them again, because like, I, don't, I don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, so, so that was that. OK, so if we can't get it, access to our large data from our commercial vendors who already have it, that means we're going to have to build it ourselves. And so now, this brings us over into how do we engineer our extraction and analysis pipeline. So the whole purpose of this is to take many binary samples, analyze it so I can get it ready to insert into our machine learning models. So I like pictograms, as you can tell, because um, any time I'm, I'm going to build like, agents in different systems, especially if they're going to communicate with each other, I have to draw a picture so I can see, OK, what's the next step and like, what's the next phase in this type of analysis? So here we are with another pictogram. So we start here with the malware corpus. So in our framework, you can have a single malware corpus or many malware corpus. I didn't know the, pl the plural of corpus is, is corpora, but now you know. So with these many samples that we have, we'll take each binary from that, you know, your, your large corpus, and then we'll, we'll bring it into our, our machine learning or our automated analysis platform. So here we start with that automated binary analysis. We're starting to extract our features. We'll do a normalization process and a reconciliation, um, because even when you're looking at so many malware samples, you'll see that there's slight variances that I cannot just copy and paste from one sample to the other. That's because different compilers have different types of optimization. That's because different malware will also have its own type of obfuscation to prevent you from being able to analyze the sample really well. So we actually have to build on features to help us with this type of normalization. So again, everything is standard to be able to put back into our model. And then finally, from that standpoint, we create a knowledge base, which is like just a huge table of lots of random artifacts. Then we choose the artifacts that we want to understand or feed into our model, and then we go into our model. So here in our research, we actually go from the binary, and then we create a binary abstraction. That abstraction is based on the six features or the six main types of data that we spoke about previously, so I can feed this into our models very easily. So we want to be able to eliminate the noise and the randomness from, from here in order to have it more standard and uniform so I can feed into our models. And then you, know, you have the models that we kind of mentioned at the beginning. All right, so here is another issue. OK, very good. I like the picture. All right, thank you. So in this case, if I speak about like, how do you generate this, like, what does that generation look like? OK, let's go to another chart. So here's actually how we engineer that pipeline. And now I wanted to give this, because in the future, if we do want to create the same framework, well, I want you to have all the tools that we used when we created it. So once again, we start with the corpus, and I put the best areas or the best ways to get like large malware database or, or cor uh, corpus for your malware to um, ingest into your analysis. Then we have an agent at the top. Agent is very simple, that we write it in Python, and that agent sits on top of Remnux. So Remnux is an incredible Linux distro that already has reverse engineering and malware analysis tools pre-built. So some tools you'll need to install or configure, but at least to get off the, off the bat, like to get started, Remnux is a perfect operating system to use. So now we create this agent. We will call it our binary analysis orchestrator, BAL. You know, it's, it's Vietnamese. Then we use various tools to help us and understand, like, how do we automate the binary process? And so I'm trying to show some of them here. So with the various tools, they're now going to, like, just give you raw data in various different formats. So we kind of want to understand what formats are we seeing this data. So we're trying to explain that here. So using the tool, we can get this type. So these tools can give us information about the metadata, the sections, your directories, your import tables, et cetera. If I want to go into the assembly language or disassemble the program, I can use these tools that are mentioned above, automate that process so, again, we can immediately pivot into our machine learning models. Looking at our import tables, our strings, et cetera, I'm trying to show you, like, you know, just ways that we can like, synthesize what we're getting from here into like, what we understand as the malware analysts and the reverse engineers. Then after that agent is complete, we're going to introduce another agent. That agent is called our file descriptor. So our file descriptor looks at the, like, the process data here. It's still really raw. And then now it's starting to create that reconciliation and normalization process that we spoke about before. So that's how we can uh, under get like our raw data into this side, create a knowledge base, just a table or a, a, like a folder, a directory of many directories, which is different files, but now we're getting kind of closer towards what the model is able to ingest. 
Then we come up with a translation process. So the translation is now, finally, we understand the features that we have, and then we extract the specific features into a table-like format. And then this is what our machine learning models are generally already created to incorporate. So this is how we can go from a simple binary, abstract the different features, translate that, and then we can finally directly pivot into our machine learning and our deployment. We can also go into other types of features or analysis if we need it. OK, so I think I have a few moments to look at some setup of the program. OK, so I'm sorry. So um, doing a demo of like machine learning is really boring. And the reason is, talking about like data cleaning and all those aspects, you know, like there's, there's I mean, it, we, we just spent some time moving columns around. So what I want to do on our GitHub, um, we'll actually post this. So hopefully by next week or the week after, you'll, you'll already have like a full workflow to go from the beginning to the end of the data sets that we are releasing. But what I want to go down is I, I want to show you just the, yeah, there are some things to look at, normalization process, et cetera, et cetera. Um, OK, so let's look at this. So in this aspect, yes, I'm showing code, but I mean, there is no other way of doing like a good demo when we're talking about machine learning models. This is how you bring in the models. So now, if we have different models that we want to instantiate and do analysis on, this is very simple. And then one, once I give you the code, you'll actually be able to see like, like what I did and why. It, 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 it makes sense after you've seen it a few times. So for instance, I'm talking about like our classifier, our linear regressor classif classif classifier, right, at this case, uh, naive Bayesian Gaussian model um, that we want to look at different data sets, our random forest, different um, hyperparameters that we bring into our various models. We can do that here. And then finally, like really when, you know, we, we talk about like the sexy part of, of AI, I think is the most boring because it's at this side. So once we have our model set up, we then go into like the classification of our data. And so that's what I'm trying to show at this case. So right here, we go into the classify the data set, and that's simply telling each model from the translation that we've already done. You incorporate the data sets that we've already released, or you can create your own, just as we showed you with the different programs that you like to put together. Then you put it into the model. So the models, in this case, supervise. The first thing that we're going to do is to train the models on the data that we receive. And then once we train it, we then predict like on unseen data that we, we haven't seen before. And then we evaluate them to see, OK, how close is this model to the actual ground truth that we've seen? And then we output the results. So in the workflow, that's why we did the workflow, so you can kind of understand how to go through this, um, this actual workbook. So at the end, let's see, OK, down here. And this is why I said like, this is the most, I, I don't know a, a better way of showing this, but this is really the output of our models. So the models that we have from the data, it tells us, OK, it's classifying. This is our logistic regression classifier. And then this is its accuracy, its precision. Uh, so these are important words. Um, I, I don't have time to explain like, what these are. But as an exercise to the expert, Wikipedia, what is precision? You know, what is recall? Like, how important are these words okay, in a classification? And then you'll, you'll see it. Like, it's, 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 it's pretty simple. It's, it's not difficult. Right? So in essence, I'm just seeing like, how close is this um, model able to detect true classes from that specific malware family that we fed in in our data set. Okay? Then when we do this for all of the models that we brought in, let me go to the very end. We then move towards like, what's called our, like our, our selection that I spoke about before. So we evaluate. We see how close are each model okay, to the ground truth. That's what these are, these are telling us. Then we go towards a selection. So our model selection would be the best overall model for the data set that we've received. And then we use that model to make new predictions in the future. But there's a problem, or there's an enhancement that we can actually do with these types of modeling. All right, and, and this, is, this is, you know, like the, the interesting part of the, of the presentation. So here, if we summarize, these are like the precision results of the different models that we brought into our machine learning, um, like our machine learning analysis from the data set that uh, we incorporated into our models. So then we can see, OK, how good was each model in the analysis? And you can see, like these models over here, very bad. These models over here, well, OK, better, you know, quite good. 
So our general format is to choose the best model and then use that to make all of our predictions in the future. But remember, the purpose of this talk is to talk about an ensemble classification or a heterogeneous ensemble classifier that can make your, improve your predictions or your selections even better. And so this is what I'm, what I'm saying. Whenever we talk of an ensemble, it just means we're taking weak classifiers or weaker classifiers. You kind of aggregate them together, average their results, seeing hopefully you're, you've selected the best models that, that work for you. And then generally, we may actually produce a better performing model. And this model is what we refer to as our ensemble or a meta model. So here's an example. Your traditional case, whenever we have a model, okay, we run through each of the classes. So here what I'm showing are each of the classes or the families in our analysis. And then I'm showing like each model and how it performed on each class. Whenever you do this type of classification, there's a specific word called a classification report and so then the models report like how well or how close or how accurate they were to each class that you're trying to predict. So the, as I mentioned, the normal case is you choose the best model, which I'm trying to show here, and then you use that model to make all of your predictions. However, you can see, you don't, even need, to, you don't need to care about the numbers, but see in green I'm trying to represent there are times when there is a model, a single model, that actually performs much better than our best overall model. And so when that happens, we can take a look and say, aha, yeah, so this actually would have been a better case with each of the classes that are coming in. So the whole purpose of building our ensemble model is to come up with a way that our model sits on top of all of these models, and then it makes a decision. Who is the best model at this specific case? And you want it to make it on its own. So now when you are able to do this, like, predictably, and it's able to better generalize to different data that we haven't seen before, we can now try and see that, okay, perhaps we have an enhanced model that we can deploy to detect new malware of the future. Oh, by the way, um, any, well, I have it up here, but did you know that ClamAV, very good antivirus, and I'm not picking on them because I use them, it's, it's very, very nice. I'm actually just looking at my time. Okay, so like ClamAV, I thought, was a really good detection mechanism because, hey, everyone uses ClamAV a lot. But in this research, no kidding, in the entire malware family that we analyzed, over 100,000 samples, it only detected 47%. And that includes malware of years ago. It still did not detect all of those. And so your antivirus, whatever antivirus that you're using, it's not 90% detection. It's going to be much less than that. And so that's why we're just trying to say that, hey, we need to deploy additional mechanisms to help us detect new malware because our current approaches is not sufficient. Okay, so now our results, just real quick. It, yes, it's numbers, but the main thing to show, okay, well, we're creating an ensemble in the workflow that we'll release onto our GitHub, like, how good is it? Well, we're able to achieve a 95% accuracy with the malware that we've seen. So that means moving forward, with the data that we've already analyzed in the past, we should have a 95%, at least with the data that we've seen, 95% accuracy or 96 you know, in detecting new malware that we haven't even seen before. That beats your antivirus that I said, ClamAV that's working on my systems at 47%. Okay, so data release. The, um, yeah, I mentioned like we analyzed like hundreds of thousands of malware samples. So we are starting to post those on our GitHub. And then in the future, when you have the slides, I hope I didn't stab anyone with the laser. Um, so um, when you have the slide, you can go to this link. And so this link show is sh it's, um, it's showing you the initial data sets that we're able to release right now. So that means if you were, want to already incorporate this into your own models, kind of similar to what we've shown, like the data is already processed for you. Like, and it takes weeks to actually get this data. You know, you just leave your systems to run for weeks until you actually have this, but now you have it for free. And then, you know, my goal is to go towards like virus, uh, virus share that gives you terabytes of data, analyze everything, and then release it over to the world. So again, I'm not picking on virus total. It's really, really good. But the thing that they can hold over people is they have access to the data. Well, now you have the data. And now we're having it for free, and then we all have the same thing. But ours is free. There's $100,000. I hope it's nice. Okay, so here we are. So the data that we're releasing is called Mabel. And then, you know, this is just the definition that we're using for our benchmark that's being released for the future. Um, if you go onto GitHub, you should see something very similar to this. Um, so we're uh, actually doing this under the um, National Science Foundation. So they've established an institute for artificial intelligence and cyber threat analysis. And so our research fits under there. And so that's why right now you're seeing this posted under the National Science Foundation. 
and this is our Babel data set, and then we try and label the features here. So at least you see each feature, there are over 600 features, and then we try to put a description of the feature and then an example. I guess I'm missing an example. No, example should be like over here. But anyway, so if we're in the hotel, the remix, and you saw me working this morning or since last night, that's so I can get this out to you. Um, but I think um, summary, yep, we said some things. Oh, right. So do I have a second? OK, two minutes? OK, all right. Uh, Okay, okay, thank you. So um, here, I wanted to put this slide together because I remember what it was like getting started into like, artificial intelligence or machine learning. And the first person I was talking about, oh, we use models, we do this and that, I was like, man, this person knows magic. You know, until you actually learn these things, you learn the standards, you learn the formats, you learn how these models work, and then you're like, yeah, there's no such thing as magic. Except until you get into deep learning, and then you're like, yeah, we still don't understand what is going on. But besides that, to learn, I wanted to give you this slide with many good resources. So here, you know, as I say, spoiler alert, your learning never ends. It's not like we do some learning and now we're really good and we're experts, because tomorrow new models are going to come out. New detection is going to come out. So we're just trying to say that, you know, be in for the journey. But there are some free versions that you could um, actually use, or there's some paid for versions, I would actually say if you do want to learn this, you know, spend at least four to six months to look at different types of analyses, like learn what the models are doing so then you can make educated decisions on what we're, um, you know, on how to deploy these models. And then I try to put like the, my favorite resources um, down here that are like really, really, really good. Like if I had to redo it right now, I would actually go through these resources to learn and it probably would have saved me a couple of years of figuring it out. And then if you like books, I kind of put my favorite books here to try and help you learn this overall process. So hopefully that's going to be useful um, to anyone in the future. OK, uh, and now, do I have a, a time for a question? Yeah. If there are any questions, any questions? I can't see. Well, thank you. Si vous avez une question, levez-vous. Oh. Levez la main. Quelqu'un va vous faire uh, passer un micro. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I have a question regarding uh, the classification part. Uh, mm -hmm. As I seen. Uh, the tool is depending of the result of multiple tools. Uh, for example, in the part of uh, detection uh, packers used in the malwares. For example, the result of detected easy. In case uh, the malware is using uh, a custom packers, Correct. how the solution will deal with it? Will the analysis be m manual analysis mm. and the result will be fed to the, to the tool or... Mm. or uh, it will be saved and compared with uh, probably malware that will be analyzed in the future. Oh, correct. Okay, so I think if I'm understanding your question um, fully, so you, you mentioned like, what about packing? Like, packing is an obfuscation or a cryptographic mechanism in which the malware is trying to like obfuscate like what it looks like. So anytime you actually have a pack sample, you have two programs in one. So one is the stub to unpack your actual payload load it into memory, and then transfer execution from the program stub into the depacked sample to, to get that like, unpacked true sample to start running. Like, that's one type of packing. And so I think your question is saying, like, how, does, how do the models identify if it's packing or the actual true payload? Because you know, if you have different, completely different binaries, but if they use the same packer, then you think like, the model might actually identify the packer and not the sample. I think that's, that's similar to what you're asking. Is that correct? All right, so that's a great, awesome, like that's a really good question and a good point to make. So I also thought the same thing. And then when we analyzed multiple samples, and I even saw that these samples are using the same packers. Like UPX is a common packer that you know, many people like to use. ASPAC is another one. Armadillo is another type of packer. And you'll actually see this in the data set. So we have completely different families that are using the same packers. So I analyze those actual samples to see, OK, how is our model? How do our models identify these different samples or families that are packed with the same packer? So it turns out um, any type of packer or cryptographic function, there's generally a seed that's used to know like, how do I generate like, where the next sample is going to, or the next memory address is going to be that I'm going to obfuscate or to encrypt. 
So these actual um, stubs, the seed, or actually how it encrypts the sample, is dependent on the actual binary inside. So that means binaries of family A, using the exact same packer, the code is still going to be different but similar than uh, like uh, malware family B that's using the exact same packer. So what I'm saying is like the models are actually able to distinguish different samples using the same packers. And that's because like when you do like deep inspection of the actual disassembly code, you see that there are different functions, but they're very similar based on the family. And I didn't, I, you know, I didn't show the data set that we actually released, but inside the data set, you'll actually see counts, and I explained it in the features, but we actually say counts from our deep inspection of like, specific mnemonics inside the disassembly. So that means binary A, binary family A that use the same UPX packer, its count is going to be similar for all of those families. But the different family, malware family B, that use the exact same packer, its mnemonics that are constant without, uh, throughout the same samples within the family, the, the mnemonics are different. But the counts are similar per family. So that means your model is actually able to distinguish your different families even if they use the same packer. At least that's what I found so far in the data sets that we have, because I was really concerned about that, saying, well, I'm just detecting the packer, not the actual family of the sample. But it turns out when you do deep inspection of the disassembly, you will actually see like, there are similarities between families, but those family similarities do not carry on into the other different families that use the same packer. I hope I answered your question. I use lots of words, but so in essence, the models can still distinguish given sufficient data that's brought in. Hello, uh, thank you for your, your, uh, your conference. Um, I would like to ask a simple question mm -hmm. um, because you, you were talking about the detection rate with uh, Climb AV. Um, what would happen if we would um, in, um, put a benign sample uh, mm -hmm. like that is a legit executable mm -hmm. uh, in your model? Will it be able to detect that it's a legit uh, executable or will it try to classify it as uh, in one of the uh, malware uh, mm -hmm. uh, classes you have? Perfect. So if I'm understanding your, sample, your, your question properly, you're saying like if I have a, a benign sample, so for instance, Chrome, Chrome.exe. Yeah. So if I take Chrome and I throw it to the, to the models, like will the model know that it's benign or will it try and classify it to the, like, the different families that we've already learned or trained the models on? Right? Yes. Is that, okay, yeah, so um, right now the current instantiation of the models is it will try and classify it to the families that it's learned. However, that Chrome or even a set of Chrome or different executables, it is not similar enough to what it has learned previously. So actually, whenever the models, like there's, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes, um, but actually when the models try and give you a classification, number one, the models will not agree, because it's like, I've never seen this before. I think it's this. Every model is going to give you a, a classification, but one, they, they will not agree. Um, usually, they're, they're not going to agree on, on the class that they give. Number two, they're also not going to be as precise. So even the models that give you a prediction, it also gives you like a surety measure. So how sure do I think I am that this sample that you've given me, this feature vector, represents the actual class that I'm, I'm throwing up to you from each model? And so when that happens, you'll usually see it right now that it's really, really low. And so I would just say, since I'm still building the models and the frameworks and the ensemble, so I've only tried that on a few benign um, samples, and then that's why I'm trying to tell you, like, hey, this is what I've actually seen, that the models are like, we have no idea. I think it's this, I think it's that. So you can actually detect the disagreement between the models, and like, okay, this needs further analysis. And then the second one is they're usually not sure about, um, like, which class that it provides. You'll see that it's, it's really, really low um, surety. So that's another way of knowing that. So we, we, right now, I did not look to see if something is um, specifically benign or malicious. I look to see if it is malicious to the extent that it, it relates to any of these 400 plus malware families that we've seen so far. So we're going to continue to grow it. Um, but that's why we're doing like that multinomial classification, which I give you different classes versus the binary. Is it malicious or is it not malicious? Yeah, I just felt this way was harder. So that's why I started there. Okay, thank you very much. No problem, that's a great question. Um, hi, thanks. 
Thank for the talk. Hello. Um, quick question: What is the size of the uh, of the train models right now? Would it be usable in an agent on an endpoint like uh, an IDEA or something similar? Or would mm. it require, because of the site, to be more in a virus total like service, like a non knowledge service, or dedicated on premise appliance or something mm. similar? Mm. Right. So I'm sorry. I believe your question is like, what is the size of our current trained models to see like where can we deploy this? So right now, even to achieve what we've done so far, I'm trying to I'm trying to see like the actual size. But the when you finally train the model, so understand, gigs and gigs go into feeding the model, gigs and gigs go into create the data sets. But when we finally train the models and you deploy the models, right now I think we're at like two gigs. And so that's, that's relatively small you know, in terms of everything that we're able to do. So once you learn, you actually throw everything away because you just go with your um, pre-trained um, pre models for your transfer learning. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little too large to uh, implement it on all the endpoints of a network or something. Mm. So if I can pause you just one second. So um, when you do something like this, you, you actually don't need to deploy your same pre-trained models to all of your endpoints. Your endpoints just need to know how do I need to submit the feature vector. And so that's if I look at the actual sample, which you give the code, that's really small amount of code. And then what do the endpoints provide back to your actual trained models? It's like maybe less than a megabyte. And so then you look at like how feasible is this? Well, it's actually really, really feasible that you let the endpoints give you the feature vector, and then your main central repository receives those, and then it gives you a prediction. Because you don't need the same model everywhere. You just need one pre-trained model somewhere. Great. Thanks. No problem. That was a great question. I don't know if I'm out of time. So I'm going to be around. Like, I'd love to answer questions if there are. Do I have, do I have time for no OK, I don't have any more time. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm so sorry. I know. I will find you. Stay there. And then I'll answer your questions. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks.